Welcome to this episode of Locked In. In this episode, you're gonna see Bedhead, me installing my new Venture Max bars from Richie. Then I'm gonna give it a little bit of a shakedown, give you my initial thoughts, as well as I'm gonna be clear brawing the Marauder while doing a short question and answer sequence to answer some of the remaining questions I had from the last round of Q&A that I did that I posted on Instagram. So if you wanna be part of the next one, please make sure to go follow the link in the description so you can be a part of the next Q&A that I include on a vlog. So if that's something you wanna watch, please stay tuned and subscribe if you haven't already. So let's get in installing my brand new set of 46 centimeter VentureMax WCS bars provided from Richie. I'm by no means paid for them by this, but if you wanna check out these bars and some of their other great products, I have links for them in the description below. But let's get to installing these bars and seeing what this bio bend is all about. So that was a fun little shakedown ride. Shout out to Mario for helping me film that. But basically, I want to give my initial impressions on these bars real quick. This is not by means of full review. That'll be coming later on the channel. So make sure to turn notifications on so you can see that when it comes out. But I have to say, initially, it is definitely very different. And I am going to be doing a comparison between these and the beacons based on the comments that you guys gave on my beacon review and initial install. Comparing the bend and shape of these compared to the beacons. But right off the bat... This having the flatter top section, I do really actually like. Compared to the Beacons, I wish it had that, so it could be a little bit more of a direct comparison. But as far as reach and drop, it is a little bit longer than the Beacon bars, which are a little more shallow and do have a more extreme angle. Now, I want some more time on these to see what I think about the drop bar angle going from a lot more aggressive angle on the Beacons to these Venture Maxes, and what I actually think about the bio band down here. And I know this might be a little bit harder to see, but that's because I do have a gel insert on top of the tops here and the bottom from Physique. I put those on pretty much any standard bar that I run just for added comfort so I can run a standard thickness bar tape for a little bit less money and just keep replacing the tape instead of getting really fat, thick tape. I tend to use that just in my experience for my gravel bikes and even my road bikes, to be honest. So definitely do enjoy these. They are gonna take a little bit more setup time. I think I might wanna readjust because you do have to really set that bio bend angle perfectly because your hand fits into it so beautifully but it's gotta be just right so that when you're locked into that position, it feels better. And since there's a little bit less movement because it's kind of a spot that you need to always grab or settle into, it does have to be really precise because you can't just kind of slide back and forward a little bit like you normally would so that this little bend here fits in the palm of your hand very, very well. But I'll experiment with this a little bit more before the review. But make sure to drop any comments for any questions you might have about these bars in general so I can make sure to include that in the full review. But now let's get on to swapping this bike out for the Marauder and getting some clear bra on there to, pit to protect that Tropical Glitz paint job that is just uh, so good and so shiny. But let's switch this out. So all I'm going to be doing is something that I honestly do for every single bike that I own is I always clear bra it, whether it's a stock bike or a painted bike. After the paint's fully cured for at least a couple of days, you're okay to do it. And if you want to have my full tips and tricks, this is by no means going to be a tutorial of this. I will put that in the links below. I have a video on how to protect your bike and basically the process I go through to do this. And it's just a great way to protect any kind of paint job and any kind of bike, mountain, road, whatever. And you can do it fully coated like I kind of have with my Cobalt Warhawks and that obviously sees a lot more dirt, potentially more ground action, let's call it. So for my road bike or road setups, I do tend to use a lot less. And basically you just want to have it over your high impact areas. So if you run handlebar bags or a frame bag, 
covering your head tube. I like to cover the top tube fully just in case I do wear normal shorts or especially jeans so I don't scratch the top tube. Then I always do the bottom of the down tube since obviously that's where road grit and grime is going to be, you know, hitting the frame pretty regularly. Then I like to fully wrap both chain stays for any kind of shoe rub. And then sometimes I'll put a little bit of piece on the back seat stays as well, just because if you lean the bike and it tends to slip, usually that's where the scratch is going to be. But again, you can fully wrap this thing. I like to use 3M products since it tends to always get, to, since it always removes a lot easier and it seems easier to work with. But like I said, we're going to be doing this Q&A while I get this done to answer more of your questions while I protect this beautiful paint job that I will probably cry if I scratch. So let's get into it. All right, so I wanted to get mic'd up since I'm gonna be moving around a lot, but let's start off with the first question from Kelly McKenzie. They asked, I want to upgrade my X's brakes. I'm assuming you mean, I'm assuming you mean Poseidon X. What's a good but cheap option? So a few things real quick is, I believe, and I could be wrong, so comment below if I am, I believe the brakes they actually spec on the Redwood are a higher spec Tektro mechanical brake, and I actually really liked those, and they were my favorite by far. So I would see how much those are gonna cost, but the kind of golden rule or mechanical brake that everyone recommends if you wanna stick with mechanical is gonna be the TRP Spires. Those you can usually find secondhand pretty easily since they do come stock on a handful of bikes. If you wanna go hydromechanical, which I think is gonna add a lot more power and a lot more efficiency for you, you can look for either the TRP HYRDs secondhand or brand new, you can get the Huin R1s for about 160 bucks on eBay. I'm gonna be doing a full review and probably a comparison for both of those brakes together eventually when I put a little bit more miles on this bike right here because it is actually using the Huin R1s. But whenever you're doing it, if you wanna do the most cost-effective upgrade, get some compressionless brake housing and do that first and make sure that your brakes are bedded properly. If they are, see if you can feel the difference in the braking power and then if you do eventually upgrade your caliper, you can still reuse that housing. So it's not a bad investment regardless because compressionless housing, especially with mechanical or hydromechanical disc brakes, is always a plus. Also too, whenever I get these kits, I always tend to get two different size widths of tape so that it's easy to cover tape without having to cut it a lot. So I'll typically get, depending on the tubing that you have on your bike, a four inch section and a two inch section. Obviously you can get one inch as well if you wanna get real nitpicky with it, but this, at least for a carbon or aluminum bike, tends to cover it pretty well and takes minimal cutting when doing it. So obviously your four inch is gonna be great for the bottom of your down tube, your chain stays to fully wrap them, as well as your top tube if you wanna fully wrap it. I do use that outer shell half frame bag quite often and I'm pretty sure, especially for my longer road rides, I'm gonna be using it on this bike. So I'm gonna fully wrap this thing all the way around where I just have to trim basically where it tapers right at the end. So you get a nice full coverage piece of uh, film on the bike. All right, so I got one tube wrap, so let's get on to the next question. Uh, Dyna plug versus Stan's dart, no BS. <laughs> if you haven't seen the SF to LA ride series video already, you know that Dyna plug essentially saved that trip and saved the day with my super gnarly rear cut on my Gravel King SK plus 38 C tires, where basically a key went into it and created, I wanna say, you know, a, a seven to 10 millimeter cut at least, and I put two Dyna plugs in it and rode that thing for another 380 miles or so with no problem. And then Mario ended up actually getting a Stan's dart for us to use. And I've used plenty of bacon strips and other items. And I actually even saw Stan's own official video when they launched that product. And I thought it was great and that the, the science behind it and everything made sense. But in use, when we plugged that thing in, it just didn't work. Basically when we punched it into the tire and pulled out all the fabric little pieces fell out with it and so it didn't actually seal it. So then I just brought up my Dyna plug and plugged that thing and just got extra plugs when we stopped at Art Cyclery. Obviously it works for people because it's still a product and it's still out there, but I didn't have a personal great experience and I don't think that it should be so complicated that I need to rewatch like a how to use video because essentially it's the, you stick it in the plug, the hole. I don't know if we went too deep into it and didn't pull out enough, but having that much margin of error 
that can happen, especially in a crucial situation like that, I don't think is worth the risk uh, for that system. So in my experience, Dynaplug's been the way to go. If I had to recommend it, it's definitely worth the money for the lack of headache. But now the head tube's done, now let's get on to the next question. Let's talk about riding nutrition, plant-based, and how does it affect your endurance or tour plans? So this is a great question that I'll probably harp on for a little bit, but some of you don't know, I do have a, a long video kind of explaining why I did this, and I'll link that in the description below. But essentially, I do eat plant-based, and I have for a few years now, and I've had it, had no honest issues with endurance riding. I've done San Diego trips, 100 mile plus rides, and been plant-based and have had no issues. If you know anything about this, and by no means is this gonna be a discussion or blowing it up in the comments of what you think about that, but it's my personal choice. I've been liking it. It's been great for me, and it's helped me with some ailments that were basically undiagnosed from doctors that I had seen for quite a while with a past injury and some complications I had, and this was something that I tried and it fixed my issues. So I've been keeping this lifestyle and I've had no problems with it. Now touring, when we did the SF to LA trip, we were a little worried, to be brutally honest, going through, especially the smaller towns, but if you know anything about what's currently being offered and how much easier it is to eat plant-based nowadays, as long as we could find a Carl's Jr., a Burger King, a Del Taco, a Taco Bell, or anything like that, most even fast foods now have a plant-based option. So we weren't super worried about it. At night, we would just typically go to the grocery store, and yes, there were a town or two that just because of us not wanting to ride to a certain store or anything like that, we might just get grocery store food and, and eat in the hotel the night before, but that was a very small complication and not an inconvenience to us. I would have probably done that regardless of my diet just because I could control what I'm eating a little bit better, and I don't like eating out and a ton of fast food regardless. You are consuming a ton of calories during that ride, so it's not a problem, but I would have done that regardless of my dietary choices. But I've had no issues with that doing long term, and if you think about it, you can still eat basic stuff like bean and rice burritos or anything like that. So even if you have to eat very simply, it's still easy to maintain it and you can still get calorically enough carbs, fats, and proteins with plant-based options. There's a ton of things on it. If you're interested in all, and by no means I'm not paid by Netflix, go watch Game Changers on Netflix. It's just about the science and the sports nutrition side of it, where they talk and test certain things and do experiments with world-renowned athletes that do live a plant-based lifestyle. Again, not a PSA for going plant-based, but if you're interested in just seeing the science behind it, go check that out. It's definitely worth a watch. And since you've watched me wrap enough of this, I'm just gonna time-lapse this in the background, in the secret, and realistically, you can't even tell if this bike was fully wrapped or not, because it is clear, and I try to do a pretty good job getting all the bubbles out. So the last question we're gonna do for this Q&A is gonna be gear that I've always wanted to test. And I think that's something that's always ever-changing, Every single time something comes out that's interesting, I wanna try it out. A lot of times that's gonna be bikes, it's gonna be components. A few things that pop into my mind that are real interesting to me are that new classified rear hub system that Scott's using, basically having a planetary gear in the rear wheel to give you essentially a two by range with a one by simplistic system. I think that's a super innovative, very expensive option, but I'd love to give it a whirl and see what it feels like. I'd love to test out some other group sets like Campy's Ekar or Rotor's 13 speed group set. And I think there was both very interesting. I've never ridden a Campy group set, so why not try the gravel one? And I think Rotor's thought process is very complicated to do, but I really wanna see what a hydraulic system feels like. Besides that, it's a lot of bikes usually. You know, I'm by no means a, a elite sprinter or hill climber, so ultra aero products, Yes, it might help me a little bit, but it's not something where I'm chasing down KOMs all the time. But I really think, you know, more bike packing specific gear is something I do want to test more often. I do have a new bike packing kind of budget set up that I'm working on that's coming in relatively soon. So I'll put that on the channel of my kind of budget 2021 bike packing gear. I want to do something that was definitely more affordable, but still quality products, even though they are from brands overseas, but they are products I've actually tested prior to receiving the new updated versions of them so I can kind of speak to their quality and what I've liked and disliked about them. So that's something that's gonna be coming down further in the pipeline, hopefully pretty soon. I think I have everything almost already here. COVID just slows down shipping. So I hope you like this video. Again, make sure to follow me on Facebook and Instagram if you wanna be a part of the question and answers section of a future vlog. I always post on it asking for what you wanna hear about so I can mention that in my vlogs that I do every single week. 
So if you like this video, please give it a like. It really does help with the channel. And again, subscribe if you haven't already. And you want, if you want to help Locked In and help me do more of these videos, because this is my full-time job, you can help support Locked In via my spreadsheet where I have shirts, coffee mugs, and much, much more, as well as on my Patreon where I offer one-on-one -on -one Zoom cycling consultations every single month for my top two tier levels. And lastly, thanks for watching this episode of Locked In. Let's get Locked In today, like tutorials and quick and